praise for the sweetness of the wet garden, wrong and completeness where God's Ralph Waldo Emerson, the writer and lecturer, the leader of the Transcendentalist Movement, began his address in 1838 to the graduating class of Harvard Divinity School quite simply. In this refulgent summer, it has been a luxury to draw the breath of life. The grass grows, the buds burst, the meadow is spotted with fire and gold in the tent of flowers. The air is full of birds. And sweet with the breath of pine, the balm of Gilead and the new hay. Night brings no gloom to the heart with its welcome shade through the transparent darkness. The stars pour their almost spiritual rays. It was a hot summer in Cambridge that year, not Oklahoma hot, <laughs> but hot enough with six students along with their professors, friends, and family in Harvard's Divinity Hall Chapel. They gathered to hear an address given to the graduating senior class and sitting on those polished wooden pews in the stuffy chapel on July 15th. 1838, a group of no more than 100 people heard Emerson, an alumnus of Harvard, a popper, now a popular lecturer, a man of letters, give an address that would be a turning point in Unitarianism as well as religious liberalism. The words he spoke that night instigated a controversy, raising ire and inspiring others to embrace a different perspective on matters of religious authority, revelation, and preaching. Only two years before delivering the Divinity School Address in 1836, Emerson published his essay, Nature, laying out the platform of his ideas that would later be called Transcendentalism, a revolutionary mo movement born from within American Unitarianism that had inspired Generations of nature writers and poets laid the foundations for religious humanism and is a part of American spirituality. That same year, Emerson published Nature. He made an acquaintance of a young intellectual, Margaret Fuller. The next year, in 1837, he met a 20-year-old college student, Henry David Thoreau, whom he would befriend and they delighted in mutual inspiration. He had started to speak out on social justice issues of the time, but from our perspective nowadays, it was a little too late and not strong enough. His reputation as a thinker was rising, just as his invitation to speak arrived from Harvard. He collected his thoughts together. He started to think about ways to talk about this theology to these newly minted ministers and to critique a nascent Unitarian Association. Started only 19 years earlier, American Unitarianism was born of the old Congregationalist churches of New England, the successor to the Puritans. When a Congregationalist minister, William Ellery Channing, among many others, articulated a new theological perspective that embraced ideas of the Enlightenment, science, the use of reason in matters of religious belief, and offered a positive view of human nature. Ralph Waldo Emerson entered Harvard Divinity College in 1825, the same year the American Unitarian Association was born. After graduation and a brief stint as a minister, he left his pulpit for the lecture circuit. Emerson wanted a religion with heart, or what he called intuition. Now, the Divinity School Address is Emerson's confession of faith. 
He offers a critique and suggestions for improving the church to these newly minted ministers, and typically that is the focus of discussions of Emerson's famous speech. What Emerson says on Jesus, on miracles, and on preaching is often the focus, and also the discussion of his individualism. Others emphasize Emerson's departure from Unitarianism and his criticisms. Many skip over those opening lines as a flowery preamble with little meaning or significance. But Emerson's opening words served more than as a preamble to his address describing the loveliness of summer. It is a theological statement. And listen closely, you may hear reverberations from our invocation that we say at the 10 o'clock service. In this refulgent summer, it has been a luxury to draw the breath of life. The grass grows, the buds burst, the meadow is spotted with fire and gold in the tint of flowers. The air is full of birds and sweet with the breath of pine, the balm of Gilead and the new hay. He names the sustenance that he finds and experiences in nature. He observes the miracle of life. He gives thanks. He speaks of hope and the possibility of renewal for all of us. Now, refulgent means glowing and gleaming, shining brightly, and with his opening lines, Emerson not only describes the glorious presentation of nature in summertime, but he also makes the point that divinity, the holy, insert whatever theological, religious term makes sense for you, that the holy is not captured in some long ago time, but or moments of inspiration have passed, he is saying that the holy, the miracle of life, dwells in the present and is found in the everyday. Not only out there, but also in this very room. Inspiration and revelation continue. The miraculous is not confined to stories in the Bible. Mm. Let alone one particular religious tradition. It is in the wonders of nature and found in life itself. Now, I first heard Emerson's words early in life here at All Souls in Tulsa in Sunday school. And when we said I grew up in this church, it was really the first 10 years, but it made an impact, a mark on me and the good kind. I heard Emerson's words first here, and after all, Emerson Hall where we have coffee hour between services, is named for Ralph Waldo Emerson. And Emerson's essay on nature has long resonated with me and members of the congregations I have served and the students I teach, whether they can name it's Emerson or not. They might talk about Annie Dillard or Mary Oliver or Lorette Savoy. I have often heard from many Unitarian Universalists that they share how they have often worshipped in the woods, on the ocean shores, along the prairie, and in the confines of their own backyards. It is how they feel whole and grounded in nature and in themselves. Yet Emerson's writing in, on nature, as well as the other transcendentalists, as many nature writers who followed them, have led people to think and sometimes it is us in our interpretations, that's the spirituality of transcendentalism, the spirituality of nature is somehow just a solitary experience. The challenge with spirituality of transcendentalism is that we assume Emerson and others tell us to go out to nature, to connect with the holy, that going out into nature is enough. However, we may find it in a park, a tree, a lone tree that's in our own backyard, the flowers out in our garden, or do we need more? Emerson and other transcendentalists would tell us, yes. Yes, go and experience the revelations of nature and learn firsthand the interconnected web of all creation. Do not take secondhand divinity or the holy. Do not allow the holy to be brought to you by intermediaries. Experience it yourself however you can. Experience it alone 
or with your partner, with your children, with a group. Experience it and then share it. Share it with others. Biographer Richard Richardson says that Emerson was clear that religious nature finds its fullest expression only, only in communication and connection between people. Not alone, not alone in the woods or the fields or by the pond, not like Henry David Thoreau, or at least how he wrote about it. It demands expression and community, sharing with others, creating something with those connections. A new transcendentalism, a 21st century spirituality for Unitarian Universalists, focuses on what other imitations have missed, the importance of community and connection. A relationship with nature is not complete without those meaningful relationships that also seek justice for all creation. Climate justice is racial justice. Racial justice is climate justice. Now, over the years, I have returned again and again to who I consider to be a later transcendentalist, one who I think brought transcendentalism along in a direction, and it's one of many others, but he brought it along in a way that gave it a fuller expression to what this spirituality for the 21st century can look like, something born out of American Unitarianism and has had many expressions over the years. And it's in the works of Howard Thurman, the great writer, preacher, social activist, a leader in the nonviolence movement, a mystic, some say, who models a version of transcendentalism that we can grow for a 21st century spirituality. Thurman has married his nature spirituality to social activism in a clear way. It's in the opening pages of his 1979 autobiography with head and heart that Thurman tells with rapid succession about the sturdy love of his mother and grandmother, the sudden death of his father, and the importance of the natural world to his upbringing. During the first decade of the 20th century, Thurman, who grew up in nature, a young black man growing up in Florida, tells stories of fishing in the Halifax River, hunting for berries, wandering in the woods, and he tells an extended story about an oak tree, so important that on the picture with his mother and his grandmother is a picture of that oak tree. It's a part of his family genealogy. And that oak tree is the place where he, as a young boy, hurting from the pains and scars and sharp edges of the world, would lean against that tree and he would dole out and share what was on his heart, the pains the triumphs. He learned a lot from that tree. He spoke of the storms that blew off the Atlantic Ocean, the 10-foot waves that swept across Daytona's wide beach. As a young boy, he embraced the fierce winds and the pounding waves. He did not fear the storms that rolled off the Atlantic, but found refuge in them. Thurman did not fear the night, instead describing it as a presence, a comfort, the night sky as black, and where the stars on a moonless night hung like lanterns. The night was alive to him and a companion to him. The ocean, the night, he wrote about them saying, they surrounded my little life with a reassurance that I could not be affronted by the behavior of human beings. Thurman, mind you, is talking about his experiences in nature and how they helped him survive the everyday cruelties of racism and poverty. The woods, the ocean, the river became his friends and taught him about relationships with the earth, a relationship that fed him and sustained him in the most difficult times. These relationships were vital to this young boy who had trouble at times connecting with his peers. He suffered as I mentioned earlier, grief early in life and that ever presence of racism. In his human loneliness, nature taught him about the relationships of growth and potential. 
a concept he would later call the growing edges. Thurman's descriptions of nature also included the tooth and claw. Rattlesnakes lurked under the huckleberry bushes. He writes about them. And every year, typhoid fever plagued his community. Thurman recognized death was no stranger to us. It was a part of the rhythm of our days. His experience of nature was not romantic or sentimental. Thurman learned to accept nature's dangers as a part of the whole, and that the violence that dwelled in nature also dwelled in humanity. Thurman's mystical understanding of nature was thoroughly, though thoroughly, communal. Coming off that strand of communal transcendentalism, fed through what he read of Emerson and the other transcendentalists, and through his mentor, Rufus Jones, the great Quaker leader, who emphasized from a psychological point of view that as human beings, all that we do is relational. And because of this, humanity's relationship with the divine develops and unfolds through relationships. Because of this, mysticism was a community-based and best pursued in groups. Thurman's brand of nature mysticism and writing moves back and forth between society and solitary experience. Nature provides the sustenance for the work in the world, its healing powers, its reminder of great theological premise of the great interdependent web of life. In 1938, a hundred years after Emerson's address to the Harvard graduates, Howard Thurman gave a speech to the National Assembly of the Student Christian Associations in Oxford, Ohio. In this short speech inspired by the experiences of nature mysticism, the South African writer Olive Schreidner, the readings of science and psychology that he dove into Thurman's last, at last lays out what he calls a new ethic that calls for a new response to nature and living in the world and what he called at-homeness in the world. An understanding that humanity is a part of nature and must reject the conceit of the old order of being that is infused in so much of our society still to this day and that humanity must hold a reverence for all expressions of life. Thurman taught the unity of all life life must be recognized and in search for the holy led to an understanding that humanity was related to all Christianity, to all of creation. I misspoke, but he's coming out of the Christian tradition. Thurman argued that humanity in its beauty and its brutality could learn much from nature. So perhaps what is most important about Howard Thurman's transcendentalist spirituality is that he did not stay on the beach or under the oak tree in his family's backyard. He went on to form a dynamic ministry at Morehouse College at Howard University and later the founding of his church for the Fellowship of All Peoples in San Francisco, one of the first multiracial, multi-faith churches, a congregation rooted in peace in the arts, and justice. He was a force for social justice and nonviolence, in particular coming out of his meetings with Gandhi in 1935 and 36. Those were life-changing and inspired him to rethink religion and to write the book Jesus for the Disinherited and outline the nonviolent tactics for social justice that would become one of the foundations for the civil rights movement. Thurman's work for new transcendentalism, was emphasizing a power of nature to form, but to sustain us for the work, to sustain us for the work ahead, to be able to be there and to speak out and to show up for justice. It reminds us over and over the power of a community that works together for a more just and loving world. That oak tree in Thurman's backyard In particular, in a moment like this, in these times, 
I think about the lesson he spoke about most often. He noticed that that large oak tree, those branches were stiff and rigid in different places. Those most stiff and rigid at the top of the tree would fall and snap. He noticed that the topmost branches of the oak tree would sway, giving way just enough to save themselves from snapping loose. But in all of this, they stayed deeply rooted. May we find this strength for ourselves in the woods, in the fields, in lakeside, and right here at All Souls and beyond. Blessed be and amen. Gently guide your sons and